ladies and gentlemen, to whom it concerns, it's the Late Late Show, and here is your host, Jennifer Glynn. and seeing all our old friends. Um, I love how the previous episodes this morning were demonstrating how passionate they are for Dublin, but I think I, I, think I take the cake on this one. Last week, Scottish roots, half Scottish, half Irish. Annie Lennox, blonde hair this week, went back to my Irish roots, reddish brown. So <laughs> that's how much I love Dublin. Um, today we have a fascinating show. Um, one of my guests, Kim Kardashian, is going to um, show me how to look younger after I've enjoyed that Irish hospitality. Um, Bono is going to come play this afternoon as well, but of course we, we couldn't afford the whole, the whole group. So, but really my favorite guest and a repeat guest, a person that's passionate about the industry, commits and volunteers on the board of the site board, is Philip Eiswald, the account director from AMIA. Oh, it's Jen, it's so great to be back here. You know I love being on your show. Thanks for having me today. Thank you, thank you. So, welcome to Dublin. Thank you, Jen. Have you enjoyed the Irish hospitality? We Have I enjoyed this time. Irish hospitality? Absolutely. It's just been incredible. It's been over 10 years since I've been here. Um, back then, it was a, a split trip between Killarney and Dublin, and we took a lovely train between both. And now to see all the changes, it's just, it's amazing. I started the visit with you um, in the western part of oh, Ireland. Scandal. At, at a, <laughs> no, Jen, let's not get into all those details. We started it out at Ashford Castle and had an incredible two days exploring Western Ireland, then moving along to the wild Atlantic Way and experiencing some of the best that that has to offer, including um, Kyle Moore Abbey and all kinds of exciting things. So truly a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to going home and talking all about Ireland to everybody back at AMIA and everybody else that I'm running into in the industry, quite frankly. But it's a thrill. It's just thrilling to be here. Great. Well, before we get down to business, why don't you tell them a little bit about your experience in the Incident of Travel Age? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, you and I go way back, but since I'm just, you know, meeting some of you for the first time, I've been in the industry for more than 15 years. And I work with Bonnie at AMIA, and I'm an account director, which essentially means sales. So I primarily work in the healthcare and pharmaceutical sector, and I, I've had a lot of different roles in my time at AMIA, starting as a trip director, travel staff, and working my way up, which I think is really a great way to learn the entire industry and really understand all aspects of incentive travel. Um, but now with my customers, I help them to put together the right kinds of strategies to use incentive travel as a really key tool for them to have better business results. Um, in addition to working with sales operations teams at big pharmas, medical device companies, healthcare insurance, also do programs that reward recognition for amazing customer service. Um, so all over, the, all over the board with Incentive Travel, tons of experience, really passionate about the industry. So the audience here is made up of the creme de la creme of uh, the Incentive yes. Travel and industry, Absolutely. events industry of Ireland. Absolutely. So, they're hoping that we're going to give them a little bit of background on the fundamentals of incentive travel programs, but also some tips and tricks to winning your business in the okay. future. So, All right, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so let's take a step back. We know that incentive travel is about creating unforgettable experiences and driving business results, but sometimes, I know when I'm working on programs back at home, it can be three years out, and I think sometimes our supplier friends think that it happens when we arrive on site, and there hasn't been... Um, a path to this. So why don't you jump into the incentive travel cycle? Indeed. So the incentive travel life cycle can be quite, uh, can be quite lengthy, as you mentioned, but really, truly, a well-planned incentive trip really does start about two years out, two or th even two and a half years out from program operation. And what I would also add, and this incredibly, um, you know, it's a tight market, it's, it's definitely more of a seller's market, so we have to really think as far forward as possible so that we can be sure we're locking in those destinations and the hotels that our clients want to be at. One of our biggest problems is not being able to find the space. So, you know, that's why we're trying to think out as, as far possible on that. I'm not going to go through all the various, um, all the various uh, um, explanations here, but I'll let you read for itself. But starting two and a half years out to that, you know, we're thinking about destination, what will be the right place to motivate this audience? 
and then from there, sending out the appropriate RFPs with hotels and DMCs, going on your site inspections, whether that's to pick the destination or your hotels, going through those contract negotiations. Um, and then from there, um, there's that period of time where actually the eligible the eligible participants are actually earning that trip. So that's an incredibly important thing to remember that there's that time period there where, yep, we know where we're going, we have contracts in place with our partners in the destination, but there's that really important period that we're gonna dig into a bit later about coming together as a team to even drive more value um, for the end user. Um, and then from there, I mean, your operational site inspections take place and then moving on to program operation. So you said that destination decisions are early, the discussion starts early. Yeah. Give me some background on how you put together a, a bid for a destination and what, what you're taking into factors. You really have to take a lot of things into consideration, Jen, and you know, obviously when you think back to program history, where have they been, um, what's the demographic of your group, what's the weather, do they prefer a fun and sun or, a, or more of a ski or a high adventure or coming across to experience a different culture, international destinations, like. Ireland, um, all those things are taken into consideration to put forth the right mix for your clients to, to look at and, and to make their, their choices from. Um, but we also have a number of other considerations such as, you know, for yeah. example. Direct airlift. Direct airlift. Um, sometimes like a, we just going through the recent um, Zika epidemic and how do we deal with that. And I think suffice it to say for a destination like Ireland, I think it's a great opportunity for you to capitalize the, on, on that. And, push some of that business that might be going to Caribbean destinations to actually come to your country. So things like that that can turn a, make a lemonade out of lemons, as we say. Absolutely. I'm being on the other side of the border of, you know, who, um, I'm <laughs> kind of just making lemon, uh, lemonade too. That's it's all we can it. do, Jen. It's all we can <laughs> a do. Good, a good exchange rate <laughs> and uh, a smile. Exactly. Um, but also, um, even when we're working on our programs as well, we look at the perception of a destination. I quite often won't, Europe is seen as, oh, we're going to Europe, um, and that's glamorous. But sometimes, too, the perception can change if it's not, like people think of Paris and you're going to Barcelona and all these sexy destinations. No offense, you're not sexy. So, but that's, that's to your benefit because, and I know earlier he said, don't sell your value. You are very good value. I throw Dublin in as a wild card all the time. We've got a program coming here in uh, June. Uh, another one that was just here last October. Neither of them were looking at Europe or Dublin. And the reason that it worked out is because when you're looking at an, um, an American property or another destination that doesn't have uh, your vat built in and your breakfast built in, you're adding hundreds and hundreds of dollars of gratuity and breakfast and costs. So, you may not be the cheapest in your region, but you still offer very good value to people. So, and because you're perceived as safe and secure and friendly, you've got so much value going for your destination. So I totally don't, agree don't with undersell that, that. Totally agree with that. So, uh, Philip, um, Really, it's, it's not about our supplier partners. It's about the participant, the winner, the qualifier. Tell us a little bit of their point of view. Right, so you know we've had some great discussion around program logistics and operations, but at the end of the day, I think what's so important to think about is that it's, we're thinking all about the attendee and the person that's earned this trip. Um, we call that the journey of the participant journey at AMIA, and we use that to really help guide um, the, the whole process. Um, so the first stage is the attraction stage, is when we announce the program and create excitement around it, oftentimes with a full campaign to support it. I'm going to talk more about ways that as um, DMCs and, and uh, D, uh, convention visitor bureaus and hoteliers, we can all come together. There are little things you can do to really help with that process and add value. Um, at that motivation stage, you need to reinforce program rules to make sure that the eligible participants know what they need to do in order to win the trip. Um, some studies have been done recently that show that programs that don't have strong communication plans and strong um, constructs, they're not, they're not producing the results that they're looking to get. Um, finally, on, or then moving on to achieve. Providing guidance, how am I doing? How am I stacking against my colleagues? How am I doing against this other region? Are there ways we can add some, some fun banter between to create a sense of competition and watch those sales rise even more? 
Um, then we move on to the celebration phase and we announce the winners. We move into that trip planning phase. That's where all the excitement comes and really dig into those media logistics details. Then we end it with a promotion. And when we say about promotion is we want to take the feedback from the attendees that just experienced this awesome incentive travel experience, use it to promote it again to the, for next year's participants to say, I want to go to Ireland in 2018. That is, they looked like they had such a great time. I want to earn that trip. And along that path, you're looking for to constantly communicate to them through different videos, mentioning teasers, et cetera. So yes. how do you create engaging communication? Or how can our supplier partners provide us with that? Um, yeah, engagement? there's a million different things we can do. And in this day of uh, information coming at you from so many different channels, it's important that we're available, that the um, incentive really is coming to them at all appropriate channel depending on your um, attendees and on the eligible base of winners. So things that, uh, that you can do very easily would be to focus on putting together a beautiful digital library full of high resolution photography and that you can easily share with your uh, clients and, and, and planners that they can leverage on their, on their uh, collateral pieces and marketing pieces. I can't tell you how much time my team spends trying to unearth images, trying to get access to a digital library with a passcode and then uncompress a zip file and then make about, it easy. How about even finding out how many guest rooms are in a hotel? I mean, why those, do you hide those that? Those important things. <laughs> So, so those are just, that's just a little idea. And when it comes to, to videos, for example, videos are so, so powerful, but make them short and concise and easily consumable so they can watch it on their handhelds and they can watch it on their iPads. Um, from there, um, I think also just letting your clients know where to access them and just make it super easy. Did I say easy enough? Yeah, okay. No, for sure. And I think this, I mean, you're talking about um, the qualifier communication, but even going back to what you said, when you're building a bid, don't make it complicated for people. Because before we even get to you, nine out of ten times, we've done a high-level presentation on safety, security, flight, weather, appropriate hotels in that destination, etc. And if it's hard to find information on your website and keep Cvent up to date, because it, it, that's you use those tools, so absolutely, that would absolutely. Be so great. Um, so, and we talked a little bit too about. So now you've um, you brought your clients here. You're, they're here for the site inspections. Our previous um, episodes um, demonstrated <laughs> yeah. some of the sales tools. Um, but do you want to expand maybe on the, the experiential side of that and what you're looking for? What do you think is a good site inspection? Because I know it was a, uh, a key yeah, component so, for these people. Yeah, uh, so, you know, there's, site inspections are critical, and I know there's going to be a really great panel this afternoon given by more of my colleagues, so I'm not going to go into great detail because they've got some really great tips and tricks. Um, but just from an operational perspective, I will tell you how critical it is, and if as hoteliers and, and DMCs that when you do your site inspections, and it's so great when you compare your operations team along with your sales team, for example. Um, don't just show us the people that are going to sell the property. Let us know who's going to operate the program with us. Let us know who's going to help us build the program with our destination partners. Um, because I can, I'll be very honest, if, if I or my team feels there's a connection with that operation team, it's a big, big bonus and oftentimes leads to uh, you know, winning more business. So that's just a little thought on, on site inspections. Great, thanks. Um, so we're gonna go back into the cycle. We're now at the attract the cycle. So yeah. creating the awareness. Yeah, so I just thought it'd be fun to throw uh, up some images of some of the pieces that we're doing for our attendees to get them excited about the experience. Um, again, going back to having access to these kinds of assets, really, really important for us. We also, um, as part of a communication strategy, love to explain what the attendees will experience when they are on site. So giving little um, nuggets of information and tidbits about the destination, the hotel, things they'll be experiencing, just what's their appetite and further motivates them to want to do more and sell more. Absolutely. And I've got to applaud you on your video. It's outstanding. I've already asked one of the DMCs to get, get it for me for the yeah, program. It's very, very well done. Well done. Goosebumps. Very well done indeed. Um, this is just another um, sample that's just outlining for another cust automotive client that so what they would be doing in terms of activities, creating these once-in-a-lifetime experiences that they can 
go back and get an email. When they get home the evening, they're talking to their husbands, wives, partners, saying, now, we could be doing the hot air ballooning in, in Napa if I just close, if I just you know, put my head down and focus a little bit more. Um, but if we do these kinds of um, communications, and the reason why our clients really invest in a good, good communications and marketing campaign is they want to engage as many eligible people as possible, right? Because the more sales, the more profit, the more um, propensity and the more, li more likelihood that they're going to spend more on their incentive trip. So that's good for all of us. And they've made more money. So it comes back to that tagline that you'll hear me say again and again, and it's really our, our brand promise at site, which is incentive travel business results. So that's just something that I use all the time when I'm talking about our industry and about site, and it's something that we need to keep in mind too, all of us in this room. So this is, a, this is an example that will, um, of a FedEx client of ours where it kind of shows them as they're earning the trip, how am I stacking up against others? How am I stacking towards my goal? Giving them that kind of status updates is really important. Um, there are a lot of um, organizations out there that don't offer that kind of guidance, that don't offer that kind of information with their attendees. So, and that is so important because many times they don't know where they're standing and they could be this close to going over the edge to earn the trip. So just some, just some things to keep in the back of your mind. All of this is going on well before we're on site operating the program, but it's very important. Well, and it's important to the person that's paying the bill. They're either, it's either a financial measurement or a, a team building or an, an emotional intelligence, whatever their return on objective or their ROI right. is, is important to the people. So, And that is exactly right, and we are tasked with that all the time, and you know, it's something that we have to be able to show them that they want, they want, to, they want to understand the impact of, that this really has in their business. So. Right. So, and do you recognize the photo? No. Uh. So now we get to the celebration phase, and this is where you're where you're finally able to reward and recognize everyone's hard work. Um, and I just have to tell you, when I was experiencing Ashford Castle with my friends a few days ago, and uh, waking up and seeing the the mist coming across the water and the slight um, frost on the grass, and it was just absolutely enchanting and wonderful. You guys have so much to offer in this destination, and so you could have so much fun doing it at the same time. So we thought we'd just walk through a few more slides that talk about um, what our guests are asking for and what we're doing from program in, uh, inclusions perspective. So these are the things we're hearing from our clients that they, that they want. They want uh, quality versus quantity. Don't push too much on them, give them time, to have a little bit of downtime as well to enjoy on their own. And when we do put the programming together, it needs to be just stellar. Um, more personal time. They like to have that time with their partners, their guests, their spouses, to enjoy the destination. At, oftentimes, pe those people have sacrificed a lot of time and to be away from their families and um, to earn that award. So this is their chance to, to be together and enjoy it. Um, I think the thing to add to is, you know, we we're talking a little bit, and we're going to talk a little bit more about demographics, but a lot of these people have been to Dublin before, or I've been to Ireland, or I've been, even in, in Canada, I've been to, the, to Montreal, Quebec City. So it's finding, it's continually seeking new and interesting opportunities and experiences. It's going, to, you know, one of the things we did um, with one of our DMC partners in the room is, you know, we created, instead of just going and having an Irish whiskey, they showed us how to make an Irish whiskey, right? And I know that, you know, everybody's, the flash mob experience we had last night was outstanding. Um, the Rattle and Hum performed for us. We, you know, we've had a lot of great experiences, but it's always looking for that next new innovative because a lot of the people that are win these awards are very well-traveled and have the money to do it themselves. So you have to figure out where can I take them behind the scenes that they can't do you know, like the Guinness Storehouse. Mm -hmm. Yes, everybody can go to the Guinness Storehouse. It's number one tourist destination in, in Dublin. But what else could you do at Guinness Storehouse that they couldn't do as a, as a traditional attendant? Right, because at the end of the day, we are working so hard to create these experiences that they could never replicate on their own. They couldn't do it unless they won the incentive award. So keeping that in the back of your mind when you're putting your proposals together and your ideas together, rather than cutting and pasting something you've done before, really thinking through, well, how can I make it just that much more special? 
And you can tell when somebody's cut and paste because half the time they've forgotten one of the, the other company's <laughs> names somewhere else. So, yes. And th that leads us to the next question. So really ask questions. Ask open-ended questions to the, to the people that are sending the, your RFP. Even if it's come through Cvent or through uh, a product buyer at Amio or somebody on my team, pick up the phone and ask the questions. Don't ask me how many people can be I'm not trying to be on a soapbox, but uh, <laughs> don't ask me how many people are in the ballroom when I've told you that and what the size of the program is. Ask me intelligent, well thought out, and demonstrate to me that you care about my business. Exactly. And from a, you know, from a program design, design perspective, Jen, um, when we're thinking through what are we putting together to make sure it's the right mix, we've put together these personas of um, different kinds of personalities and different likes and dislikes. So we have our learners, people that like to go to museums, culture, history. We have our calorie burners, are super active. They like to do the um, intense bike rides, rock climbing, getting the zip lining, for example. Our connoisseurs, this is a big one right now, the foodies. There was a lovely foodie, foodie tour that we were presented with yesterday that, I mean, Dublin's got incredible culinary and um, uh, beverage delights. Um, but this is a big thing between wine tasting and um, the whole gamut. And then, of course, our, your loungers that just want to pull up a chair at the beach or at the pool um, and replenish that vitamin D and have a little rejuvenation. Um, <laughs> and I, mean, I think you also have to look at the new millennials. They're looking for active. They're looking, they might be bringing their families along now. Mm -hmm. So, again, you have to look at the whole picture, not just your traditional, what you've done before. I mean, and, and look at your customer. If it's an insurance company, don't offer me hot air ballooning and extreme sports. <laughs> They're never going to go for exactly. it. Exactly. So, um, exactly. understand. And this just nails it, right? Nails it, absolutely. And you know what? We heard, we heard some great, great points of view from Jonathan um, around some really important considerations on, on, on experiential gifting. Experiential gifting continues to be huge. Um, there are more and more options out there in the market today, more than ever. Um, and they're here to stay. And I'm, they really, really add so much d dimension to a program. Mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. And my clicker is done. <laughs> you have a sticky clicker. <laughs> okay, there you go. So, so is CSR still as big a component as it was? And how could you do it in, within, within a region that maybe doesn't have the same kind of... Yeah, so, you know, CSR continues to be um, an important element to a lot of our incentives. Um, I'm not seeing it on every incentive trip, but I, it still is something that a lot of our um, attendees and clients, quite frankly, really enjoy giving back. and. But what it comes down to is creating the right kind of CSR. And a CSR activity that's gonna be engaging for the attendee, but it's gonna deliver a nice result for the destination and really turning that into something that can be usable for the client as well, depending on what their corporate uh, goals are. Who do they support from a nonprofit and charity perspective? Digging into those details, especially when they're coming up with, uh, during a site inspection phase and if they're asking for ideas around CSR, do your research. It's all on their websites. You can see the kinds of organizations that they invest money in and want to support. So just keep that in mind if you get the request to add a CSR or uh, component to your incentive itinerary. So delivering once-in-a-lifetime experiences, you want to tell us about some of these events that you've done? Yeah, and you know, this is just, these are some photos from some, a program that was in Dubai, um, having dinner in a, in a lovely desert oasis. Um, but being able to create these once-in-a-lifetime experiences, there's a million different things here in Ireland. Jen, you mentioned several that the um, organizers and our hosts from, from this event have done. And when they can catch you off guard and all of a sudden you're hearing a beautiful choir singing or whether it's the um, river dancers that you thought were actually banquet servers that are all of a sudden dancing on their trays. Um, you tried to join them. I tried, I, I, I wasn't allowed back, but um, <laughs> maybe next time. But any, anyhow, those kinds of things will go so far and they will last those lifetime of a memory and they'll bring it home and talk about it for years and years. So now that participants have gone home and you've promoted it, what, what really do a lot of people forget about after the fact. Yeah, you know, one of the things, you know, unfortunately, one of the things that, that does get looked over quite often is measurement and doing a, a post-program survey and really asking the right questions. And it's nice to, to hear, you know, feedback on 
what did you think of the hotel product? What did you think of this activity? But I also like to dig into asking other kinds of really deep questions around motivation and how did this incentive travel experience change my behavior, want me to do better, drive me to have better results. Those are, like, those are the kinds of, of metrics that um, our customers can take back to their executives to really show the value of the incentive travel experience. And so when it comes time for marketing that for that next year, they're gonna get the same amount, if not more, for that budget. So, not putting you on the spot here. <laughs> You've done it but, before, Jen. <laughs> but are you open to these people? So say you host a, a program at the Shelburne with Yvonne, are you open, or are you encouraging them to call you after the program to see how it went so that they can? Absolutely, absolutely. A, de a, a, a proper debrief um, with not just your hotel partners, but frankly, all your destination partners is critical um, because you need to know the areas you exceeded, areas for upper, uh, improvement, um, but yes, in, indeed. And it so rarely happens. And the other thing that, um, from my perspective, is billing. Yeah. If billing takes it can take three forever. months and it's not correct, it can ruin the whole experience. So make sure you don't just do the sales phase, but you've pulled it through operations, so don't leave it with the accountants in the end. Absolutely. Close, close the loop. Absolutely. So before we wrap it up, there's, you know, we've talked about some interesting times in, in the United States. And, you know, with the... The recent inauguration, I can barely say it. <laughs> um, how do you, let's put a positive spin on this. How yes. are you seeing that Trump might affect, I mean, I'll speak to the financial, but what about yeah. you for the pharmaceutical side of things? Yeah, I mean, it is interesting, of course, right? So um, having you know, customers that are, are, are linked to pharmaceutical healthcare, um, I actually, they, they are feeling some relief. They are feeling um, more confident about their futures. And in fact, um, you know, a, a great example is, you know, for the first time, I've got some pharmaceuticals booking more than two years out to actually inking and signing contracts, which is fabulous news. So to your point, um, finding those nuggets of, of positivity um, are, are, are not a bad thing. Right. Now, on the insurance side of things, there's been recent regulations in both the U.S. and Canada. Canada's moved forward. We, we probably won't take a step back, step back on our regulations, but the, what that means for Canada, there's no longer any, if you have external brokers, you can no longer do an incentive program. So you need to focus on people who have internal sales forces, for one, when you're doing your research and due diligence. It doesn't mean they can't come to Dublin. It just means that ballroom that I book every single time will actually get used now for the full day for education. And that individual now is now paying their own room rate mm -hmm. and their own um, travel over there. But on the U.S. side, the, there is some discussion that some of the, the regulations that Elizabeth Warren has been trying to, that has been put forth and the changes within the U.S., that, that might just get all wiped away. So I would, I would keep your eye on that, uh, on the industries. And, you know, automotive, obviously, is, you know, staying in the U.S. And, and there's also the, the uh, like, they're so being so um, focused on the U.S. And some programs that may have looked outbound now are, are looking within the U.S. So there's, there's pluses and minuses to everything. And like exactly. you said, Julia said, embrace the madness. Embrace the madness, indeed. So, um, you know, thank you so much for being on the show. Always I, a pleasure, I have to push Jen. you off for Kim Kardashian to make me look younger. <laughs> but um, if you do need other sites, resources, seriously, um, the site global, um, the site index is a good um, uh, research for base that the foundation puts out every year. Um, CIS is the course that Julia was talking about, um, global conference, online learning. All this is available on Site Global. We're all staying here for lunch, so please reach out to us if you have any uh, questions about the acronyms we use or any of the uh, information we presented this morning as well. So, so I'm, I'm gate cr crashing your party. Gate crashing. <laughs> <laughs> There's just a couple of really interesting questions that I want to kind of take yeah. advantage of you yeah. being here to, to address to you. Um, this is actually one that I think we all want to know the answer to. So, have you ever been present at a launch event when Ireland was announced as the next, next incentive destination? And what was the reaction? Have I been present at a launch event? And typically, when we do those kinds of launches, usually we do sort of a reveal um, of, the, of the destination um, for next year's destination on the final night of the current year. Um, and I have, but it was when I was a trip director. Um, it was years ago, and the room erupted. I mean, it absolutely erupted. Um, there is such a strong, um, there is such a strong affinity for Ireland for so many Americans, and 
for lots of different reasons, and a lot of it has to do with their heritage and their background, but truly the perception that this, con that this country is a lot of fun and offers so much, it's easy to get to, it's safe. Um, yeah, I mean, the crowd went crazy. Excellent. To really um, answer what, your what, what about in, in Canada, Jen? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think because uh, for both the scenarios that I'm thinking off the top of my head, they would have never been out of the, the US or Canada. And because it was, the perception was, it's enough of, a, uh, of an incentive, but it was, it's not over the top as a destination. People were just so over the top <laughs> that these people, that they were going to Europe and that they were going to Dublin for their programs, so. Fantastic, yeah. well that's good news for us all. Um, there's, there's another one just in relation to that whole process. I mean, there's the huge value of what you brought to us here was to give us an understanding of all the things that we never see. Right. So we're, we're on the delivery side, so we just see the end bit. But to get to that end bit, there's obviously a huge process yes. that doesn't just happen. It's all planned. It's, it's meticulously planned, in fact. Um, but, but the question here is, ha have you ever engaged with the local destination partners in the promotion marketing stage mm -hmm. of a program? Absolutely. We do it, we do it a lot. Um, and that is why I said, when it comes to having those assets for us available, specifically you know, digital assets, um, is really, really important because there is a hunger for them. And um, yes, I, we use them all the time. So. And people don't have the budgets they have anymore. Before we used to fly, like our, our insurance clients would fly over a videographer to create a unique and different video for every. Now it's like, exactly, give me what you got. That's I'm gonna, really I'm good gonna, point. And, and make it editable so they can tweak it if they want to. We, we, we can give you footage of this guy in a green jacket abseiling down the side of <laughs> Uh, that one of Europe's you, highest stadiums. Did you yeah. notice Philip and I behind Roche? <laughs> <laughs> Having a drink in the pub? We're there. No, it good. was great. And there was one question I saw in here asking about the videos that were shown today. Yeah. And yes, those are totally consumable and totally something we would want to use. Fantastic. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, great news. To, to Jen for putting this all together. Really, really insightful. And to Philip for filling out all the details for us. Fabulous so well and here. so uh, articulately. Thank you, Thank you so much.